I'm Matthias Knapp of Orpalesk, and today we're visiting Impact Cube in London, UK. Impact Cube is an ESG hedge fund and data provider with over 10 years of experience in investing in ESG factors. We'll talk with Impact Cube about what makes them unique and also get to know the core team. We'll start with Larry Abele, who has a storied history of over 20 years running and building quantitative strategies for global investment powerhouses before co-founding Impact Cube in 2010. So Larry, good to meet you. And please, as a start, introduce yourself and Impact Cube. Sure, Matthias. I'd be happy to tell you a little about my background and the background of the firm. Uh, my name is Larry Abel. I started in the industry in 1996, working for Rob Arnott at First Quadrant. I then moved to San Francisco, working for Barclays Global Investors and their Advanced Strategies and Research Group. After that, I moved to New York, working for Deutsche Asset Management and their Derivative Overlays Desk. Then along came 9-11, and I relocated to London and took over the Portfolio Engineering and Quantitative Strategies Group out of London for Deutsche Asset Management. Finally, in 2004, I decided I was ready to set out on my own and start a hedge fund. My two first lieutenants left, and we were this standard three guys in a room hedge fund. We launched with 20 million, and we grew to 2 billion. That firm was then sold to Aspect Capital, and I began focusing on ESG research. We've been researching ESG data sets since 2008. We were the first hedge fund to sign the PRI. What we learned, however, was that ESG data sets at the time weren't of much use to us. They were mostly subjective scores that weren't of any help to us in producing absolute returns. While most of the industry talked about looking for the risk and opportunities that would arise from looking at environmental and social issues, the vast majority of the industry was going through a compliance exercise. We decided to build our own data set, so we spent the next three years building a 15-dimensional model of sustainability and getting the necessary data sources to, to, to operationalize the model. That business now has 50 clients globally and advises three trillion of assets. At the start of this year, we made the decision to combine our analytics business and our investment business into a single firm branded Impact Cubed. In 2015, I met Antti Savilaska, my co-portfolio manager, at a conference, I believe it was in Copenhagen. Antti was the first ESG researcher I met who really understood markets. After meeting Antti, I looked for an opportunity to invite him to join our firm as a partner, which he accepted. That was six years ago. Antti and I are supported by a team of 12, including analysts, operations, business, and sales. Our office is in central London. Tell me more about the strategy. What asset classes and instruments are you focusing on? Our fund will use an equity market neutral strategy focused on large cap equities, medium cap. We'll trade globally, mostly from the Acqui universe. We focus on thematic trades surrounding the major shifts taking place in society, not just climate change, but issues around food, obviously transport, heavy industry, biotech, health, even artificial intelligence. Let's go a little deeper here with Antti Savilakso, partner and head of research at Impact Cube. What would you say is different about your strategy? What makes us different is our focus on the sustainable development. Now it's pretty clear that the financial markets are going to be very, very different because of sustainable re development related trends in the upcoming decades. And indeed, there's a plenty of ESG funds in the market that are trying to capture this opportunity. But it doesn't mean that it's easy or straightforward to do so. Now, and we have a plenty of things that makes us quite different, uh, different, not only as an absolute return fund, but as an ESG fund as well. First of all, um, sustainable development related issues tend to be quite emotional and there's a plenty of wasted interests. Um, so you need a, a fair amount of skills and experience in order to navigate uh, the oftentimes, oftentimes obscure issues and to be able to quantify those issues into, uh, into investable data sets. The second one is that the, we don't assume that the, all the ESG issues are material all the time. Indeed, 
ESG issues tend to materialize in, in different pockets, in different groups of companies, in different points in time. And it's a mistake to kind of assume that all of this happens, uh, happens the same all the time. Instead, what we do is that we, we focus on the tail ends of this, of this interest. So instead of looking for ESG opportunities for about 20,000 companies that we currently cover, we look for mainly short opportunities for 1,000 or so companies that are, uh, that are problem from a sustainable development point of view. And we mainly hunt our long opportunities from a thousand or so companies that provide a solution for sustainable development. This focused approach provides two different uh, two different benefits. One is that the, these tail ends tends to be the places where the materiality happens. This is where the markets don't really uh, necessarily crash the, the, the risk and the opportunity of the ESG issues and so on. But it also has the additional benefit that once you short the bad companies and go long on the good companies, it guarantees the net positive impact of this absolute return fund. And Larry, back to you. What benefits do you offer investors? Our strategy is very liquid, uncorrelated to other strategies and major asset classes. We're targeting a 12% return with 8% volatility. Our strategy has a negative carbon footprint since in our short book, we have a lot of heavy carbon industries. In our long book, we tend to have less heavy carbon industries, thus creating a negative carbon footprint. When combined, one euro invested in our fund offsets about 12 euros invested in long-only global equities. We offer excellent reporting, both of return, risk, and our impacts. You also receive 23 years of experience spanning the dot-com bust, the 2008 subprime mortgage crisis, the 9-11 attacks, and recently COVID. We've been managing money for 23 years and have survived all of these shocks. And Larry, how do you construct a portfolio and manage risks? Our time horizon is three months to three years, which means ex-ante risk management is extremely important to us, i.e. portfolio construction. We spend lots of time not only choosing which stocks we want to be long and short, but by carefully balancing the two so that we get rid of common factor risk, beta risk, market risk, currency risk. We have four rules to investing. Diversify, 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 and diversify. We diversify across baskets, our themes. We diversify across geographies. We diversify across time frames, And we diversify across securities within our themes. We typically hold six to 10 themes and have 300 securities in our portfolio, approximately 150 long and 150 short. We don't take positions in illiquid names, which we define as having less than 5 million euros of average daily volume. And we never take more than a 5% position, either long or short, in any one name. Our gross leverage is approximately one and a half, so rather low. And our net leverage is extremely low. We keep it to plus minus 5%. The strategy will be housed in an Irish ICAV, which will be a sub fund of the Good Bodies Fund Services platform. We'll use two prime brokers, HSBC and SEB. The fund administrator will be Northern Trust. Antti, as the head of research at Impact Cube, please also speak to us about the opportunities you focus on and how do you see the outlook of your strategy? Most of the time when people think about sustainable development, they automatically think about climate. But sustainable development is so much more, more than just the climate. And there's a plenty of plenty of things that happen, happen um, outside climate change in sustainable development. In climate change, one of the, one of the examples in the fund is the, is the US listed real estate trade. Here we assume that the climate change um, is going to inevitably happen. There's already enough carbon in the atmosphere that is going to make the, the climate change happen uh, to a certain degree. Now, the climate changing means um, more intense and more frequent weather events, including flooding. And we, the trade is basically built on looking at the US listed real estate market and realizing that there's a thousand fold difference between the most flood prone properties compared to, to some others. And the trade is basically just going short for the companies that, that have a thousand fold flood risk compared to others. One other example of the trades in the fund is the alternative protein trade. So animal-based proteins are much, much more carbon intensive for the whole planet. There's a recognizable trend where, where these meat-based proteins are moving to alternative proteins. So people are, are consuming more alternative plant-based proteins rather than, rather than the meat-based proteins. Now, this is uh, partly driven because of the, the climate-conscious consumers are making the, the right choice of moving from a carbon-heavy protein source 
to a carbon light protein source. But it's also um, also driven by the fact that the, um, the alternative proteins tend to be healthier. And in the midst of the pandemic, people are looking for healthier choices, and therefore they are they are kind of gravitating towards from a, from a unhealthier uh, animal-based proteins to a plant-based alternative proteins. So our short basket of, of uh, factory farming and animal-based proteins um, versus the, the long basket of alternative proteins, it should be um, uh, it should be performing quite well, uh, not only because of the climate change reasons, but also because of the consumers uh, looking for healthier uh, choices. So the health basket uh, is based on the um, on the fact that the obesity um, levels in the world are, have reached pandemic levels. Um, uh, this is well recognized by the World Health Organization and the and the Sustainable Development Goals themselves uh, recognize obesity as a, as a global problem. This is not only a health problem, it's also an economic problem because of the obesity, obesity links into unemployment rates um, and increased sick days and so on. It's increasingly clear that the governments will regulate obesity as a problem going forward. Now, fast food companies and junk food companies in, in particular with their high fats, high salt, high sugar content, content foods is, is a major culprit and it's pretty evident that, um, that this will be regulated, much like tobacco is regulated in, in the past few few decades, where the, the advertising will be constrained, the availability of the of the junk food will be constrained to, to a certain degree. This will lead into a reduction of demand of, of junk food. Matthias, these issues are massive, they're everywhere, and they're not going away. One thing's for sure, it's gonna be a very rocky road for equity investors, and those well positioned, it's gonna be highly profitable. I want to thank the two of you for giving us an insight into Impact Cube and your processes. Thank you a lot. Matthias, it's been an absolute pleasure today. Thank you for your time.